Hey, yo, I saw some movies in January. You know what it is. Let's talk about them. So pretty solid week overall. Uh, I saw a lot of crime movies. I saw some long movies, but uh, you know, let's just start at the top. Let's just start off with the first thing I saw this month, Spencer. So Spencer was very much a vehicle to flex Kristen Stewart's acting muscles, and she does a good job. She does a really good job as Princess Diana. This film is a little slow. It's a little boring, I would say, narratively, but it's beautifully shot. It's got a great soundtrack from Johnny Greenwood that is fittingly regal in its instrumentation, but it's also sometimes haunting and dissonant with the way that it's uh, orchestrated. I really appreciate the film being uh, more of a deeply psychological drama as opposed to like a straightforward biography. I won't say I'm gonna be watching this film again anytime soon, but I'll certainly remember it for a long time. The Intruder. For a film that's like almost 60 years old, I was surprised by how uncomfortable it kind of made me feel in some parts. Like this film does not hold back in regards to slurs or violence. I think for the most part, the portrayal of desegregation probably could have been handled a little bit better. Granted, that's a bit to ask for a movie that dealt with an issue uh, so early on in the 60s, but there are black characters in this movie that essentially play supporting roles to a lot of the white demographic in this small southern town, and there are some white savior tropes in play here. Nonetheless, I think this film is still a very raw portrayal of early 60s racism, and I think it's very admirable that it doesn't hold back in that regard. Also, there's a really great performance from William Shatner in here. I honestly think that this is his best role. I mean, I haven't seen a lot of William Shatner films, but this is his best role that I've seen him in. He plays a really great racist, and I know that's a weird compliment to give anybody in any context, but uh, he just knocks this shit out of the park. Triple, double, no assist. Suicide Squad, or The Suicide Squad. Hey! How come we had to make the titles of these movies, like, confusing? Um, weird. Anyways, The Suicide Squad. So until this film, I wasn't really ever able to pinpoint James Gunn's humor, I guess, in a lot of his previous work. I mean, if you look at the Guardians of the Galaxy, right, it, that movie is pretty funny as well, but just because a lot of Marvel movies have a similar cadence in regards to how jokes are delivered, it's hard to really pinpoint, um, I guess a distinct style of humor, but with this film, it's front row and center. The violence is over the top, the jokes are irreverent, so I think those two together, they mesh really well, and overall, The Suicide Squad is a really entertaining package. I think it's also important to recognize as well the source material, like, The Suicide Squad isn't really ripe with a lot of well-known characters, at least, I'm, I speak for myself exclusively, like characters that I, I know or care for, so, I think that gives Gunn a lot of breathing room to write these characters to whatever ends he feels necessary or wants. They're not held down by any expectation. Like, who is Peacemaker? Who is the Weasel? Who is uh, Polka Dot Man? I don't know. Do what you want with them. And I think just having that freedom makes it a better movie and I had a good time watching this. Small Engine Repair. I didn't know this was a stage play beforehand. I didn't know this movie originally started off as a stage play before watching it, but like it's overall, I'm gonna throw in like a, a filmmaking 101 uh, term in here, but like the mise-en-scene, like the actual setup of uh, like the staging and the props and the characters, it felt very stage-like and so it was. Uh, it's adapted from a stage play written by John Polono. He's also the director, first time. I think overall this movie's pretty good. Uh, like, the thing that it excels at the most is the chemistry between the three main actors. John Polono, John Barenthal, and Shea Wingham are absolutely believable. Like, their chemistry is really, really good, and you buy that these guys have been friends for a really, really long time. Eguire, the wrath of God. It's crazy to think about how, um, Werner, or Werner, Ver I'm not good with German names. I mean, first and foremost, I can see how Herzog uh, went on to direct a bunch of documentaries because like, this is filmed 
very similarly to a documentary. It, it's almost as if a camera crew got transported into the 16th century and just started rolling camera on these conquistadors, like bumbling in the jungle. It, it very much feels like that through its cinematography. There are shots where uh, it is just people on a wooden raft in the middle of the Amazon. And it feels a little dangerous, but it, it lends a sense of believability and like immediacy to the situation. It's weird watching this film when I've already seen something like Apocalypse Now or any other type of, like there are huge Joseph Conrad uh, Heart of Darkness type vibes. So if you've seen a movie like this, you've kind of already seen it. Uh, with that said though, Klaus Kinski is really good as the title character. He's doing like a proto Jack Sparrow type physicality with his performance, which I thought was really enjoyable. Belly. Hey yo, this movie is sleek. It's sexy and it's sophisticated as hell. This is directed by Hype Williams, who is a prolific music video director, if you don't know who's directed, uh, music videos from a ton of great artists like uh, Missy Elliott, Busta Rhymes, uh, P Diddy, if he still calls himself P Diddy, I don't know, I don't, I don't keep up with that. This is very much a case of a film being style over substance, but the style, okay, is really freaking good. There's a lot of depth of field, there's a lot of wide shots. Some scenes will just straight up be one color, whether that's a, a sepia tone or just completely blue. Look, if you're coming into this film for the performances, you're gonna be disappointed. DMX is fine, Nas is fine. I would actually say the two best performances are from Method Man, who does a lot with his limited screen time, and Tyron Turner as Big Head Rico, who has the most iconic character introduction I've ever seen, where he just straight up eats a banana. And it's, it's weird, it's like awkward, but I love it. <laughs> I, I honestly do. Cradle to the grave. More Jet Li, baby. I don't know what it is with uh, Netflix just dropping a lot of Jet Li's Hollywood films, but uh, they're on there. I would say Cradle to the Grave is his weakest one. This is a rewatch, I've seen it multiple times. It doesn't exactly hold up. I would say the Tom Arnold jokes are, haven't really aged well, in my opinion, and also the fight scenes are, Fine, I would say the best one is probably the uh, MMA fight that he has in the uh, underground fighting arena. But for the most part, uh, not not his best work. The Unforgivable. I know this film is supposed to take place in Seattle, but it was filmed in Vancouver, and when you live near Vancouver, you just can't help but notice this shit is not Seattle. Like this shot, this shot, and this shot, like, look, I don't know. It's not anybody's fault, I guess, but like I had the same experience watching Deadpool 2 where it's like, you, you just you just recognize it and uh, it just kind of takes you out of the film subconsciously, I guess. I don't know. Sandra Bullock was um, good, I guess. Viola Davis, don't look up. So the overall message in this film uh, is important. It's 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 good. It's it's definitely important. But I, I just feel like Adam McKay here is giving such a dated take on the issue. I think about other films like The Inconvenient Truth or Pixar's Wall-E. I mean, I'm kind of being broad here, but like this overall statement of climate change and ineptitude of businesses and government who are in power who can do something about it, but choose to not do something about it. I feel like Don't Look Up gives a bit of a dated take and it's nothing really new that uh, I haven't seen in other movies that talk about this topic uh, as well. In as much that there is a great cast here, um, I just kind of feel like the overall writing and where the movie lands, it feels generic. Goodfellas. Not much to say. This is really great. This is a really solid film. De Niro's great. Joe Pesci is fantastic. Ray Liotta is sick as always. This is uh, Martin Scorsese in his pocket that he operates really well in. Very similar to movies that we would see in Wolf of Wall Street or The Irishman or Casino. Speaking of Casino, Casino. I like this more than Goodfellas. 
okay. Uh, it's three hours long, but I really feel like Scorsese has assembled the Megazord with this film. I think it's worth noting Sharon Stone's performance here as Ginger because she just goes for it. She goes Mach 1 in this film. The amount of screaming and crying that she does in this film is nuts, but I think the eventual descent of every character here, as is commonplace with most Scorsese films, is so perfectly portrayed by Sharon Stone. But also, De Niro is also great. Like, Joe Pesci is great. Like, these are all people who can hit threes when they need to, and they just do it. And I think Martin Scorsese has perfectly encapsulated this version of 70s Vegas uh, in a little globe and presented it to you on film. And it is, it's great. I, I love this film. A Fistful of Dollars. This is a really solid Sergio Leone Western, as is a lot of Leone's Westerns, but with here, I think it gets a little overshadowed by the next two installments in the Dollars trilogy. Still, I think Clint Eastwood is able to manifest a lot of charisma with some good old fashioned male stoicism and a lot of the wide shots and a lot of the blocking that you see that Leone expertly does in a lot of his other works is really well showcased here. A few dollars more. I'm absolutely in love with the theme that plays in every duel in this film, Ennio Morricone, God tier composer, God tier, just puts in work here. If a fistful of dollars is the muscle and the foundations of this trilogy, then Lee Van Cleef is the steroid that jettisons this entire trilogy into the stratosphere and into a realm of its own because where we head to next is bliss and where we go to is the good the bad and the ugly five out of five five out of five undeniable okay eastwood van cleef wallach morricone and leone if this is your lineup dude this is the 95 96 chicago bulls for spaghetti westerns this movie is entertaining it's funny it's sometimes brutal and very often it's suspenseful because again leone is employing those like close-up shots on everybody's eyes when some shit's about to pop off and it's just oh you just you just feel it you just feel it in your bones rarely does a film perfect the genre that it's in, but I think Leon just goes for it and like this is it dude, this is like the perfect spaghetti western, I'm gushing thinking about it, yeah it's three hours long, but dude I enjoyed the entire trip, I love it, I love this film, I really do, it's a blast. I saw some TV shows, we can't forget about the TV shows, Peacemaker, I'm enjoying it so far, it's not done yet, still in the first season, The Future Diary. It's a reality dating show where the gimmick is these two people have to carry out uh, these different challenges or objectives that are written in this little diary that gets given to them throughout the day. And the diaries are often tropes that you would see in romantic comedy films. I think the production is pretty good and the diary gimmick is pretty interesting, but I just kind of wish that the show would go into the meta aspect of it more because there certainly is there's a paradoxical loop that you can get into when talking about this show you have a reality show which purposefully incorporates the production team into the show itself which highlights that the show itself is not real but the people are real because they're interacting with something that isn't real I, like i don't know i just I just wish the, sh wish the show would get into that. And there's like commenters on the show too, but I feel like it's a bit of a missed opportunity for them. Cause again, I wish they would kind of go into the meta textual aspect of the show, which I found a bit more interesting than the actual uh, show itself. It's a little hammy, it's a little pokey, but what reality dating show isn't really? The Hungry and the Hairy. Stop, stop the presses. Cause this is a, top 10, you know what? Nah, it's a top five Netflix show uh, that I've seen on the streaming service, honestly. It is a food and travel show that is all based in Korea and it's hosted by Rain and Hongchul, who's a comedian. And their chemistry is undeniable. 
they are able to riff, each other, riff off each other so well. And the food is also so delectable as well. But I think most importantly, this show is comforting. It's pleasant to watch. And the cinematography and the production and the editing is so maximalist. It's, it's like the amount of money that they poured into this show uh, just helps it go a long way. And I think most importantly about the show, it's life affirming. It is such a beautiful show and I highly, highly recommend it. Uh, that's everything. That's everything that I saw in January. Uh, did you see anything cool? Did you see anything whack? Let me know in the comments if you want to or you don't have to. I don't know, it's chill. It's a relaxed show. I like to keep it a comfy vehicle um, when we're here. I will probably see you in February or I won't, but I probably will. Okay, bye.